Good morning. I am Pastor Alice, and I'm blessed to be with you this morning. We're so glad you're all here, and a special welcome to those of you watching online. This is our last week of the backpack blessing, so if you haven't had a chance to grab a backpack yet to help supply school supplies for youth in our area, make sure you head out to Connections Cafe after this. There's about 40 backpacks left, so hopefully we can get all of those today. The other thing is after service through the rest of the morning, right over here in Discovery, we're recording some more Holy Spirit stories. So if you would like to share with us how the Holy Spirit's worked in your life, we'd love to have you pop in there and record a little video for us. Uh, we were sure blessed by the ones that were recorded last week and can't wait to hear more this week. So I ask you now to stand as we join our voices together in our opening hymn. We begin our service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we welcome you this morning into this place and into our lives. 
Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit that we might be reminded of your great love for us, your unending mercy and your amazing grace. Move in us today as we respond to your presence with praise and adoration through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me now as we take time to confess our sins in silence, reflecting on how we have sinned against God and against one another. Now, please join me as we pray together, acknowledging our sins and turning to God for forgiveness. Loving God, as your children, we ask you to hold and comfort us as we confess our sins. We are a broken people in a broken world because we are estranged from you. We have chosen to serve other gods to worship and chase after things that ultimately produce pain. Hold us now in your loving arms and remind us of your mercy. Like a good parent of a wayward child, forgive us, restore us, and lead us into new life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our God is an awesome God who does not tolerate sin in our lives. Therefore, God sent God's one and only Son, Jesus, to pay the price we could not pay upon the cross. By His wounds you are healed, and your sins are forgiven. Living as a forgiven child of God, may you be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to live for God alone and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sin of the world. Have 
Please join me in prayer. O oh God, your ears are always open to my prayer, the prayers of your servants. Open our hearts and minds to you that we may live in harmony with your will and receive the gifts of your spirit through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may now be seated for some special music this morning.
Please stand as we sing together the Alleluia verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Our scripture readings today come from Hebrews 13 and Colossians 3. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And then from Colossians 3, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And as you're doing that, check out this video. We want to draw your attention to our next Alpha class that's starting up September 3rd, and so we're giving you about a, a month and a half to put you on notice here for this class. It's uh, 11 weeks long, and we're holding a mission of hope, and we are taking Alpha out in the community. And so um, just you might say to yourself, well, where's mission of hope? Well, we'll let you know. We'll send you there, and you'll get to meet lots of different people, some people from our church, but hopefully others in the community as well, because Alpha is a community-oriented uh, series. And so if you've never been through Alpha, Alpha basically is an 11-week course on some of the basic questions of life and of really Christianity. And so we would encourage you to be part of that. Every week has a meal involved with it. You get to make uh, some friends and um, you get to answer some tough questions. I like the word gritty. Did you see gritty? Not the gritty, but gritty. There's a difference. And gritty, alpha is gritty, meaning that we get down to some tough questions. So we want to invite you to that. You have a little postcard on your chair there, so please take that home uh, with you. I want to say welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Pastor Paul Hennings, and it's so good to be here with you this morning. Everybody online, we're thrilled to have you here as part of St. Mark's Online. 
We're continuing the summer series entitled Fired Up, and this is the last Sunday that we're talking about spiritual disciplines. And would you believe it that you are involved in a spiritual discipline right now? As you stare at me with those wonder stares, you're involved in a spiritual discipline. And actually, it's the spiritual discipline of corporate worship. Now, you might think to yourself, oh, that's, that's interesting. I never thought of corporate worship as a spiritual discipline like prayer or like fasting or like solitude. But what you're involved in here is what we call spiritual disciplines that involve other people. Most spiritual disciplines involve just yourself and God, but this one involves other people. And corporate worship is about experiencing the presence of God with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those are the two ingredients for worship, the presence of God and our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the, the people of God have been doing this pretty much since time began. You notice that God didn't just create Adam, God created Adam and Eve so they could corporately be in the presence of God. Adam and Eve multiplied into many peoples, and Abraham and his family were invited to corporately be in the presence of God. And then Abraham and his family were called the Israelites, and they were invited to corporately be in the presence of God and to worship. And then as time went on, you see this move into the first Christians. I would bet that there is not a first Christian who thought to himself or herself, I'm going to go home, turn on the radio station, and worship God. And the reason for that is because corporate worship is defined by being together in an amazing experience of God. William Temple, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, he's famous for saying uh, Christianity is the only organization that exists for its non-members. Think about that for a little bit. But he wrote this about worship. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. When you walked into this building this morning, were those the first things on your mind? Or did you wonder if the coffee was going to taste good? Or if the donuts would be out? Or if somebody would be sitting in your chair Or were you worried about how your hair looked? Or if you don't have any hair, just how you looked in general? Or were you concerned about your activities later on in the day? Did you think about your finances and you felt maybe a little twinge of guilt because you thought, oh, I walked past that offering basket? What were you thinking about? this morning. For you parents, were you wondering whether your kids were going to make a big mess during worship? Or were you thinking, I want to quicken my conscience by the holiness of God? Probably not. We probably weren't thinking this. I have to admit, I wasn't thinking this. I was thinking more about how am I going to deliver my sermon? I've got to shave and shower and all these other things because I can't come to church looking like a bum. I'm the pastor. But when you think about what the Israelites experienced in the Old Testament, they experienced worship in a completely different way. They experienced worship with the fire of God in their midst, with the presence of God physically there. They came to worship hearing the lambs that were going to be slaughtered in worship. They came to worship with trumpets and incense. It was an activity that involved all the senses. This is what it means to worship, and it was corporate. Everybody came together. 
Do you get a sense of this kind of worship? Too often, I think that we come to worship this spiritual discipline of corporate worship, and we're so concerned about the other things of this world that we miss out on the presence of God. The other thing that we do is that too often we think that worship is really all about ourselves. Today's Christianity has too often forgotten the importance of the corporate within worship. What I mean by this is um, there's this thread in Christian theology these days. I'm not sure how much I agree with it. I, I'm not going to necessarily think that it's totally wrong, but there's this idea that everything that we do is worship. And I get it, but we talk about worshiping in, <clears throat> when we leave this place and when we're listening to the radio. We, we do all kinds of different types of worship. Maybe you're in the shower and you're singing a praise song. I always love that one. We're worshiping in the shower, whatever. Um, and then you can worship by going out into nature and you can worship in you know, different places. And to me, too often we forget about this in this worship. For example, one of the most famous contemporary Christian songs in the last 30 years is, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Now, I love that song. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making fun of it. But do you know how many times you said I and my in that song? This is sometimes what we think about worship. It's between me and God. But that's not corporate worship and the spiritual discipline of gathering together with other Christians and telling them to move down, you're in my seat. <laughs> Corporate worship is this question of how can we spur each other onto love and good deeds as we meet together. Corporate worship is coming into the presence of God and looking at each other and going, yep, I'm going to be doing this with you forever. We need to gather together to worship. Now, this is not a sermon on coming together physically. For all of you online, you are worshiping with us, even though you're not physically here. I'm talking about the kind of worship that gathers people together to hear the Word of God and to be filled with the Spirit of God. You see, the devil wants to isolate you, and the devil has used even some strains of Christian theology and over heightened them to tell us that you don't need to come together in corporate worship. You can just have this perfect little relationship with God by yourself. And the problem with that is that it's part of the strategy of the enemy to isolate you. That's one of the devil's main tactics. The devil wants you to get in your head, isolate you, tell you that nobody else is experiencing what you're experiencing, and that nobody else can experience how you truly worship, because worship is about you and God. It's not about other people. But this is part of the isolation strategy. When I was in Kenya, I went on safari. This is many years ago. And I loved watching lions hunt, I forget what the animals were called, but let's just call them gazelles, because we know what gazelles are. And they hunt gazelles. And you know who they would go after? The weakest one and the one that strayed away from the pack. That was the easiest one to pick off. No wonder Peter says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, wanting to devour somebody. Because Peter gets it. If I can isolate you, the devil thinks to himself, then I can speak into your life more than other Christians can. The discipline of corporate worship, though, defends against this. Discipline of corporate worship defends against the idea that I can go it all alone. You need the person next to you. You really do. Even if you don't know who they are, I hope by the end of the service you introduce yourself to them. I wouldn't even mind if you did that during my sermon. I wouldn't bother. I just keep on going. <laughs> the discipline of corporate worship defends against the isolation strategy of the enemy. 
If you feel isolated, find another Christian. Come to corporate worship. The other thing is that corporate worship defends against the superiority complex of our own spirituality. I know this might be a shock to you, but you have an ego. Let me say that again. You have an ego. I am really surprised there are husbands and wives that are not looking at each other right now. You have an ego. And the devil wants to get your ego to think to yourself, ah, I don't need anybody else. I'm going to do this alone. My spirituality is the best spirituality. By the way, we in the Christian church called this 20 years ago. We had a name for this. We called this the worship wars. The worship wars were how is it best to worship? And some people said the best way to worship was with the organ, and there's no other worship. No way, just the organ. I know that's what you're thinking. I know, I can tell. I'm just kidding. Then other people said, no, we got to have drums. We got to have guitars. And the problem that happened is that it wasn't just the style of worship that people debated. It was who was really authentically worshiping. I really, sometimes that word authentically gets thrown around, right? Because if you lift up your hands, then you're really authentic. I haven't seen anybody lift up their hands yet today, by the way. Or, you know, if you just keep your hands in your pocket, you're not authentic. We, we tend to think that our way of worshiping is superior to others. We have this superiority complex when it comes to spirituality, and the devil loves that because he wants you to look down on the person next to you. The devil wants you to look at the person next to you, and instead of seeing somebody that you're going to worship the Lord with forever and ever, the devil wants you to see somebody that's not as, you know, put together as you spiritually. There's a story of an elderly lady who was well known for her faith, and she was very proud of her faith, so much so that she told herself, I don't need the local church because they just aren't as faithful as me. And so on Sunday mornings, instead of going to corporate worship, she would stand at the front of her porch and shout out, praise the Lord, and the whole neighborhood could hear it. Next door to her lived an atheist who would get so angry at her proclamations, he would shout back, there isn't any Lord. Hard times uh, set in on the elderly lady, and one morning, a Sunday morning, she not only shouted out praise to the Lord, but she prayed to God to send her some assistance. She said, praise the Lord, God, I need food. I'm having a hard time, and I need some groceries. The next Sunday morning, the lady went out to her porch to do the normal things that she would do, and next to her porch was this large bag of groceries. And so she shouted, praise the Lord. Her atheist neighbor jumped out from behind the bushes and said, aha, I told you there was no Lord. I bought those groceries. God didn't. The lady started jumping up and down and clapping her hands and said, praise the Lord. Not only did he send me groceries, but he made the devil pay for them. Now, that's a funny joke, um, but the theology is terribly wrong, right? The, the neighbor's not the devil. And sometimes when we're all alone and we get a kind of superiority complex of our own spirituality, we start to miss the mark. And instead of realizing that our neighbor is somebody that Jesus calls us to love, love your neighbor as yourself, Instead, we look at them and call them the devil. You see, you got to come back together for corporate worship because this is where God speaks the gospel into your life and you get to bounce that off of other people. Here's how the discipline of corporate worship empowers us. It empowers us with the proclamation of the gospel. You've come here this morning and I don't know exactly what, what you thought you were going to receive, but 
My hope for you every Sunday is that you receive the proclamation of the gospel, the gospel that Jesus died for you, that he rose from the dead, that your sins are forgiven, that you are a child of God, that you are redeemed, that you are loved. This is the gospel. And the gospel changes our hearts. It reminds us that we were once lost, but now we're found. It reminds us that we are all on this journey with Jesus and that he speaks love and he speaks hope into our lives. This is the proclamation of the gospel. You hear it when you sing songs that remind us of what Jesus did for us. You hear it in our confession and forgiveness. You hear it in our praises. And hopefully you experience it from other people as well. Corporate worship empowers us with the proclamation of the gospel, and it empowers us to respond in gratitude to God. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's kind of this rhythm that happens in corporate worship that, that really, I don't know, I don't know if it happens when you're just worshiping, you know, individually, uh, wherever that's at. In corporate worship, there's this rhythm of somebody up front or or in the worship service, we proclaim the good news, and the rhythm is then we get this response. I love it when Alice said this, and maybe you don't catch this, but it happens every Sunday at 8.30 service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's a lot. That's a mouthful, right? And then you say, I have to tell you, every time you say that, I almost want to say thank you, but it's not there in the book. <laughs> but that's that rhythm. I just proclaim to you the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, gospel, the love of God, gospel, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, gospel. And you said, and also with you, gospel. And we get to respond in gratitude. This is how corporate worship works. And this is why it's a discipline. It's a discipline. When I was a kid, it was definitely a discipline, <laughs> corporate worship. My parents would wake me up every Sunday morning. They would, primarily my mom, because my dad was already at church, and my mom would drag me to church in our GMC Jimmy, okay? Anybody remember GMC Jimmy's? and we would drive to church, and we would sit in the A-frame church, and I would sit with my mom and my siblings in the second row on the right. You're in my seat. <laughs> so I'll sit over here, because apparently these rows are reserved. <laughs> and we would sit there, and I'd listen to my dad every Sunday, and let me tell you, it was a discipline. And I would have help. There was a lady named Sandy Lewis who would always help me. She would always rub my back and help me make it through the service. She was always great. One Sunday, we went up for communion like we do. We went up to kneel down. My mom needed to go blow her nose. And so she tells this story often. We exited out in that door over there. We went to the office. She blew her nose. We came back in, sat down in the seat that you're sitting in right now. But what she didn't realize is that while she was blowing her nose, I took the secretary's tape and I put tape all over my mouth, <laughs> covered it completely because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> so why don't you just take, and, take tape and cover it completely? And so we sat back down and I'm <laughs> sat back down and I sat down and everybody sat down and everybody in about the third and fourth row started giggling <laughs> because they thought my mom had taped my mouth shut. <laughs> Corporate worship is a little bit of discipline, isn't it? I tell parents all the time, it, it really is so important to bring your kids to worship. It just is. Even if you have to tape their mouth shut. Because there's a discipline to it where you hear the gospel 
and you get to respond in gratitude. You know, I want to just end by sharing that um, one of my favorite quotes by an author, his name is Richard Foster, who wrote on spiritual disciplines. Uh, he, he wrote this, genuine worship has only one leader, and that's Jesus Christ. And so I would just want to close with this idea that our true worship leader is Jesus, and together we proclaim his victory as we worship God. I want to end with this because I feel like um, one thing we're doing here in corporate worship uh, is that we're, we're doing something that's going to last forever. When I read Revelation and when I read the New Testament, I'm reminded that we're going to be worshiping God forever, that this life is not the end, that we will have a new life with Christ in heaven, and we will gather with all the elders and the angels and the saints that have gone before us, and we will worship together, and Jesus will lead us in that triumphal, triumphal procession. And it's not just Jesus and you, it's Jesus and everybody. Which reminds me, this is why corporate worship is so important for us, because we're going to be walking hand in hand with Jesus into the pearly gates, into eternal life, and he's going to be our worship leader forever and ever. Will you stand for a minute? I want to close in prayer. And I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you, and uh, we're, we're just going to experience corporate worship like we're going to experience it in heaven someday. So we please grab that hand of the person next to you, and let's pray. God, we thank you for this discipline of corporate worship. We thank you that we get to walk hand in hand with our brothers and sisters into eternity worshiping you. And what a thought, Jesus, that that worship is going to be so unique and dynamic and diverse. It's going to be filled with pipes and drums and strings and wind instruments and instruments that we've never even worshiped with. And it's going to be filled with voices of every language and every tongue, with people of every color, of every nation. And we are going to worship you. And everything is going to return to the way it was in the garden, where Adam and Eve, without sin, without shame, without, without blemish, worshiped you. Give us a vision of that worship every Sunday we come together. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the gospel that is proclaimed as we come together and worship. Help us to respond to it today and every day this week. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's worship.
we join our voices now proclaiming the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Good morning, Lord. We are thankful this morning to be able to worship together in this space, to sing our praises, join our voices in prayer, and abide in the truth of Scripture. Lord, help us never to take for granted the freedom we have in this country to freely and openly worship you and share the gospel with those around us. God, I lift up to you today one of my friends who is a missionary in Thailand who shared of the murder of a pastor who is serving there with his family. God, we lift up Pastor KT's wife and children who witnessed his murder for proclaiming you, Jesus. We ask for peace in that area and peace with his family. We continue to join our voices in prayer for our nation. God, we boldly ask that your truth and voice would be louder than any other voices. We pray for unity. We pray for peace. We pray for healing and hope that all people could experience and share your love. We lift up those who are in pain and suffering to you, Lord. You are the great healer and comforter. We pray for comfort and healing for those who are battling disease, sickness, and injury. We also cry out for your protection and comfort for those who struggle with depression, anxiety, loneliness, grief, addiction, and other situations that can feel unbearable. God, help every one of us know that you are a friend who gets our struggles and walks with us in the valleys and celebrates with us on the mountaintops. We thank you, God, for the covenant of marriage. I lift up to you, Travis and Linda, who I had the blessing of officiating their wedding yesterday, Lord. May their marriage always have you at the center. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings we receive through you. We thank you for your protection over the Alpha leadership team this week that went to Nashville to hear the Alpha conference. We are excited to see how God will work through them and Alpha in our community. God, we thank you for who you are, for how you love us and all that you've done for us. We praise you when life is hard. We praise you when life is happy. We choose to thank you in all the in-betweens. We pray boldly together now as brothers and sisters in Christ the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now hear the benediction from our Lord. As you go on your way, may God go with you. May God go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join our voices now in our closing hymn.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.